Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. This is the March 2018 Q&A. Yep. Uh, all of our Patreon supporters, $5 and above, have the ability to submit questions when we solicit for them on the Patreon page. And we are very thankful to all of our Patreon supporters, a dollar above, because they're the reason this channel exists. Very much so. We have a lot of questions, so we'll just go ahead and get the ball rolling. No rhyme or reason today. They're just kind of out of order, and uh, you haven't seen any of them yet. No, I have not. These are all surprise ambush questions. <laughs> ambush questions. Yeah, that's ambush Ian with questions. So Michael W., Will the rollers on an HK delayed blowback system wear the inside of the receiver over time? No, never. No, they won't because the wedge that pushes the rollers out when the gun's not locked but in its in battery, mm -hmm. uh, when the wedge retracts, those rollers retreat into the bolt head and there's absolutely nowhere for them to wear on the receiver at all. Yeah, they never touch the receiver. Now, yeah. they may wear on the trunnion, mm -hmm. the locking re I'm assuming he is meaning the locking recesses on the, Probably, of the trunnion. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. I think think that i mean it's a question of which is is harder the trunnion or the rollers and i think it's the rollers well with with that in mind we do know for example that the way you fix headspace issues on a delayed blowback roller system is by putting in plus size rollers right or you adjust the headspace by putting minus rollers too really the roller size are what dictates yeah. headspace so i suspect that because of that it is possible for the recesses in the trunnion to get pounded into slightly larger uh, size over time and the solution is oversized rollers. And that would make sense and that's why there yeah. would be plus rollers to adjust that. And that's typically, hey, fix it. If the gun's out of headspace, you just add plus rollers and you're back in spec. So if that's the case, it's not the rollers getting smaller because they would get, they wouldn't get bigger, they would get smaller. Right. So, okay, yeah, interesting. The caveat there, I'm not entirely sure and I haven't seen the question so I didn't research this ahead of time. Nope, but that's our best guess at it. Yeah. Yep. But they definitely will not wear the inside of the receiver. No. no. <laughs> All right, Tim K. If you had a $2,000 budget for a rifle to use as both a hunting rifle and a precision rifle for competition, what rifle and optic, oh, that makes it harder, would you choose? By the way, I didn't prepare for these either, so these are kind of cold on me too. I'm not big into the precision rifle market. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, for me, I would almost be tempted to say, well, I can go spend 200 bucks on a hunting rifle, Yeah. which is going to be, I don't know, any sort of Mauser... Uh, Surplus Swedish Mauser, a K31. Or a Winchester Model 70 or something like that. Yeah. Something, yeah. Stuff you I, see at Walmart, a, for that matter. I can go to a pawn shop and get a perfectly adequate hunting rifle for two or 250 bucks. And what differenti it differentiates a hunting rifle typically from a precision rifle is a number of things that aren't necessarily important for accuracy for a small number of shots. Right. So a hunting rifle typically is lightweight and has a very thin barrel, and if it's a good one, it's going to be free-floated, but you're yep. typically going to have a standard, traditional, like, plastic polymer stock. Yep. You're not going to have adjustable length of pull. You're not going to have adjustable cheek weld. You're not going to have all this kind of stuff that turns what is a hunting rifle into a precision rifle. Also, uh, maybe a fluted barrel or a thicker barrel or right. things like that. On a hunting rifle, I don't want a heavy barrel. I don't want a bipod. Yep. I mean, I wouldn't object to the bipod, but I don't need a bipod. It's a lot of weight to carry in the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um... I would probably want a much lower power scope. Probably. Um, precision rifle, especially if you're shooting at long range, you're going to need a larger, mag higher magnification optic just to effectively see your target. Although um, a variable is useful in the field, definitely useful in hunting positions too. Yeah. So if you had to combine the two, probably mm -hmm. a three to nine optic. Yeah, typical. Um, the answer that I come to for a precision rifle is a Ruger R uh, precision rifle. Yeah, but the RPR. That's kind of because that's the only one I have substantial experience. Yeah, with. but the RPR. What is an RPR? MSRP. It's like fifteen hundred bucks, right? No, they're less than that. I think you, if you go for three hundred eight, I think thousand dollars. All right, so it leaves you a thousand dollars for glass. That's not. You can get a perfectly adequate scope. Yeah, you know, if you were to take an RPR, whether it's in three hundred eight or six five Creedmoor, preferably, and then put on the Viper PST Gen two that yeah, we did in the What Would Stoner Do? Seven or eight hundred bucks. Yeah, you're 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 not a precision rifle at that point, but you're definitely a more than capable hunting rifle. Yeah. You could get I don't know that that, that PST is what I would go for for that application. Something like a three to nine or a four by twelve. That's what complicates this conversation is that the the Gen two right. The, uh, I don't want a one to four or a one to six no, for a precision, for a precision rifle. rifle. You really want a lot of magnification, yeah. and that's not something you're normally going to throw on a hunting gun. No, but for a hunting gun, something like three or four is going to be fine. Right. So three yeah. to nine or a four to twelve. This is so what you land up with one. What you land up with our recommendation here is a gun that's neither really. Yeah. It's not a really good hunting rifle, and it's not a good precision rifle, but an RPR. With maybe a Viper or something like that would get use. You could use it for both. Yeah. It's not a good pair of uses to try and combine into one gun. No, it's weird, isn't it? You would think they would be, but they really not aren't. so much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Duke and H. Oh, excuse me. Drew H. 
How is Dugan Ashley doing? I'm glad to see him making appearances on the channel. I missed that glorious bastard. <laughs> so did we. Um, he's actually doing quite well. Um, when we got to do a lot of that filming and some of the footage you've seen on the channel already, we have actually one more segment that's coming in the future that we did during that filming. Um, uh, he was great to work with. He's doing pretty well. It was awesome to work with him. And the goal is to do more. Um, yeah. We've had some conversations about maybe doing some more content for the channel with him. And it is a pleasure to have him back. And even if what we did with him isn't exactly Carnicon on the channel, at least it had that mm, that flavor to it. And it yeah. was it was a lot of fun. It was even more fun to film it than it was to actually put out the video. <laughs> but honestly, he's just so he's doing quite well, honestly. And, I'm, and thanks for asking. Casey. Uh, Follow-up question. What room do you keep Dugan locked up in when not filming with him? Oh, well, the basement. Yeah, well, actually the dungeon. Well, yeah, it's under the trap door. And yeah, 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 yeah. Pull yeah, the know, carpet back and then unlock the trap door. In, in a proper prepper type situation, you know, we've buried a storage shed, a right. container under the ground, you know, quite deep. And there's at least four locking doors between us and that. And that's the only place you can keep a Dugan because on an average day, he'll break through two or three of those. You go in and replace them every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So two or three of those doors per day is a general consumption rate, but the dungeon with three to four locking doors is about the minimum. That's what I'd say to that. Uh, Zachary T. I know this is from a few years ago, but in your Caltech RDB review, Ian mentioned he was taking it to a class after the conclusion. I was curious if Ian did end up taking it to the Pat McNamara class, and if so, how did the gun do? Thanks. Yeah, I did. Yep. Um, we didn't, I don't think we actually filmed anything there that we did an interview with. We did an interview with Pat Mack, and we did a, a small segment about shooting through, I think, uh, vehicular glass. glass yeah. But we didn't do any footage of the class itself because the honest truth is we were there to do the class. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it ran pretty well. I don't... Did it have one or two issues in there somewhere? You, you did have, I think, two malfunctions, and the issue that you ran into, if I, I'm, I'm speaking for you, because mm -hmm. you were the one running the gun, but the issue you ran into was a bullpup issue in that when the malfunction occurred, they were actually quite difficult to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't much. No. It wasn't anything, you know, serious problems, but when you have little minor issues with a bullpup, they are a lot harder generally to remediate. And there was a drill in the class that was a, um, it was a speed reload transition drill, if you Dude. recall, that was yeah, like a little that, contest at the end. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, so what yeah. this was is, and it's kind of neat, it's a last man standing sort of thing, so everybody's on the line. I don't remember the exact course of fire, but it was something along the lines of, you had two rounds in the magazine and you'd fire two, dump the mag, reload, fire one, transition to pistol, and, and fire like that. It was something like that. Yeah. But what it required was a, a certain amount of rounds in the first mag, a dump, a reload, firing whatever was left in the last mag, and a transition to the pistol. And um, Doesn't not go well with a bullpup. Not because of skill set, but you were one of the first ones out of that yeah. because the bullpup just does not lend itself to that type of a speed exercise. Yeah, not like an AR does. Or if, even an AK. That, that, yeah. it's, it's a weird... When you have to, okay, so when you're on the target, here's the word this, I'd mm -hmm. like to hear your part on this, but when you're on the target and you're doing something like that, and let's say you're not breaking contact with target to do a reload. So on an AR, mags out, mags in, close, bolt, fire. You've not had to change anything. You've not come off the target. And with the bullpup, this, without breaking target engagement, is much more challenging. Well, I think you could probably do it if you spent as much time practicing it as you would with an AR. You think so, though? I mean, this is quite... There's, when you're here without breaking target focus, you can still... You can see it. That helps. It's in the periphery. This is yeah. all muscle memory at this point to get it in, right? Yeah. I think people could do it pretty darn well, but mm -hmm. only if you put in a lot of time. I think it'd be a lot of iterations. Yeah. A lot of iterations. Yep. Yeah. So that, that one held you back, and there was like two malfunctions that were harder to clear because even with that gun, you have to turn it upside down, open it up, and then like the chamber's down in this yeah. deep hole. And there was a lot of dust in that class. There was. That, yeah. was, that was not ideal rifle conditions. So having a, a hiccup or two in the rifle wasn't a complete shocking event. Yeah. Um, overall, it, it ran pretty much exactly like we were talking about in our review. Like it's 95% of an AR. The gun did well. Yeah. 95% as well as an AR. <laughs> That's where so much of this lands up going, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, Dale S. Maybe more of an Ian question, but I remember mm. reading that Colt couldn't figure out 30-round magazines for M16s in Vietnam, and Special Forces guys bought 30-rounders off the civilian market. Is there any truth to this? And if so, I'm curious how that came to be. I don't know that they couldn't figure them out. I yeah. think the 30-rounders existed, but they weren't yet in the supply line. I think that's what it was. And yeah. super cool guys were getting them through whatever method or means they could. As they always do with everything. Which we saw in the Son Tai raid. Yeah. They had 30s, which were real early for 30s. Yeah. But they wanted the best of breed everything for that raid. And they somehow acquired them, even though those weren't, like, an, they didn't have, like, an NSN number. Or they weren't yeah. in the supply chain yet. That's not an issue of it being Colt couldn't figure it out. It's being, it's an issue of the Army takes, any bureaucracy takes time to incorporate new stuff into its 
inventories. Right. So they made the 30s. They just weren't in the supply chain yet. Yeah. And the cool guys got them ahead of time because they needed them. Right. This, like, happens The cool now. guys always get whatever. I mean... Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. not going to let Private Snuffy go buy whatever he wants out of, <laughs> you know, Walmart. But Pat McNamara probably has a lot more leeway to be like, oh, I need this. I will acquire this. And look, I'm a professional, and I don't buy crap, and it actually works perfectly, and it'll do the job better. And the Sun Tai Raid being brought up was a very ambitious endeavor, and they yeah. really wanted best of breed. I mean, they had, like, real early, they weren't red dots, but they had real early sighting systems. And those things they legitimately bought out of the back of a sporting goods catalog. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And they had carbines that were not standard issue, and they had 30-round mags. They had uh, the coolest cool guy stuff you could have yeah. at that moment. And that was because they were going into a low-light environment and all yeah. the kind of things that came with yeah. Sontai. And it went beyond guns. They went out and requisitioned ladders and hammers and axes and... Stuff for physically breaking into prison cells and breaking into the buildings. Things that are also probably not in the standard supply chain. Yeah, exactly. Just like these 30-round mags were not. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so that's really, I think, the reality of that. Yeah. And then they started trickling in, and you started seeing them in normal soldiers' hands, what, the early 70s? Something like that. Honestly, I'd have to go I don't want to give a date, but uh, I will give a date, although this may not be the right date. But if my memory recalls, you started seeing 30s in, like, 70, 71. Okay. Like, in standard conditions. But I'd have to go look it up. Don't quote me on that, but that's my that's my vague memory of what it is. William S. Do you think shotguns can be reintroduced to 2G ACM type matches if they are limited to be less gamey, such as a manual action tube fed shotgun holding nine rounds less or total? Yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, I don't is think there they anything need anything more to the question. Well, no, that's okay. it. Okay, no, absolutely. I think they're. It's not even a matter of having them less gamey. It's a matter of changing the rule set to properly reflect the appropriate use of a shotgun. That's where I was going with that. I don't think they yeah. need to be limited or less no. gamey. Um, I think that what you see in three gun with shotguns is a result of how the rules are written. But if the rules are written in a way that have a focus on practical use of the shotgun, yeah. then it doesn't matter if there's an open shotgun, even with a muzzle breaker there or not. If it applies in a more practically oriented environment, then that's the way you find out if gear is good or not. Right. Now, what I would also say is not reintroduce, because one thing I do have heartache with is the idea of three guns in a stage. That always, to me, has seemed very artificial and foreign. Yeah. So what we would, what I would do and what we have done, although we haven't done it in a long time, is we actually have run 2G ACM, but it was shotgun and pistol. Right. It was not rifle and pistol, it was shotgun and pistol. And I have a whole rule set around shotguns and a scoring system around shotguns that changes it so much that when we've done that, it's a whole different world. I really enjoyed that match, and I think shotguns are boring and stupid, and I don't like shotguns. But, man, that, that it's, it was really impressive how much just, and not a, not a tremendous change in the rules, but no. just some fairly simple changes made a tremendous difference. One of the big things that we did with this is that uh, you started with the shotgun fully loaded, mm -hmm. and you could not transition to your pistol until the shotgun either ran dry or had a malfunction that was unclearable. And then when the shotgun ran dry, you had the option as the competitor to either reload the shotgun or transition to your pistol right that right there changes so much of the dynamic of shotgun it does Be because three gun is so much about how quickly can i reload the shotgun and now you have a you have your own prerogative if i can reload this shotgun fast enough that it that merits using a long arm then i will reload but if i'm in a situation where it is now faster to transition to my secondary right changes the entire dynamic of the match and so all of the really gamey goofy reloading things the the big sticks that are hanging off your belt, the mags that, you know, rotating tube feeds. X-rails. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All that stuff. All of a sudden now, the, the standard is, is it both more reliably effective and faster than drawing a pistol? And if it's not, then all that stuff just goes away without any rules banning them at all. With that said, if you have a reliably box-fed semi-automatic shotgun like a Vepr 12 or oh. a Saiga... The choice of transitioning to your pistol versus just reloading gets changed. And right. now this is where a open gun actually has a lot of merit. And we're proving out that as long as it's a reliable box-fed shotgun, reloading the shotgun makes more sense yeah. because you're far faster with a long arm and more accurate than you are with a pistol. And that's exactly what you would do in any sort of real situation. It, there's got to be a compelling reason for you to ditch a shotgun and replace it with a pistol. Right. You're, you're going from something that has 98% stopping power and lethality plus range yeah. to something that is pew, pew, I think I got it. I mean, yeah. no, seriously. Well, yeah. and this yeah. is a compelling reason to make that switch. It is. But this, chunk, and I've got 9 or 12 more rounds, 
is not. I actually, and I, this is not meant to anger any three gun shooters because I'm not anti three gun. I never have been. I'm just saying that we like what we like and we mm-hmm. have a different emphasis. But I do think that the rules and divisions around the way the shotgun is handled in three gun has actively held back the development of proper box fed sub, uh, shotguns. Mm. Because the minute you have a box fed semi automatic shotgun, you're immediately in open. Right. No one wants to be in open. So as a result, no one's using these things except the guys that are willing to be an open or armored trooper or something like that. But the regular divisions exclude them. Yeah. And as a result, this... this <laughs> And they exclude them specifically because they are better. They, they, They're which fundamentally is, better. Which is the opposite, I think, in my opinion, the opposite goal of what we're trying to find out in matches like this, which is what is the most practical gear that has the most optimal effect. Yeah. So you don't want to actively exclude things that are most optimal. What you want to do is make it practical enough that stuff that isn't practical doesn't become useful. It's it's like trying to protect revolvers in handgun matches because well, yeah. if everyone could just use a semi-auto, who would use a revolver? If everyone could use a box-fed semi-auto shotgun, who would keep using a pump gun? Well, well nobody in competition, and maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the answer, then, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Then you have the division for the the held back. Yeah. You know, the the, the low-speed high drag. The classic, guys. Yeah, revolver. Yeah. And don't take that as an insult because that's the division I'm in half the time yeah, with rifles. because we enjoy I it. like shooting bolt-action rifles right. in matches where they have absolutely no place. Um, you know what would be cool? Mm. It'd be cool if we could, like, find who first came up with 3-Gun and ask them what the deal is with the shotgun. That would be a really cool video, actually. Huh. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to think about that. Something one. to think about. The other thing that's important to the shotgun match is to change the scoring mechanism. Yes. So the other thing we did with the two GACM our shotgun rules, uh, and I think they're online, I could post them in the link below, um, is uh, birdshot was only for knockdown steel targets for mm-hmm. safety reasons. Any other target, paper or steel at a distance beyond X, which I think was 25 yards, mm-hmm. uh, was buckshot or slug only. Yeah. And slugs on paper counted as three hits. I thought it was four. No, it was three. Okay. And buckshot counted as the best two pellet hits counted. Okay. And we scored the paper as best two hits. Mm-hmm. So if you had a slug right in the zero zone, Done. awesome. Right, so that that scoring mechanism also changed things. And now there was a game that not a game, but something you had to strategize. Do I want to use buckshot or slug? Right. And there were stages, for example, I went to where I loaded only slugs because it made sense for me. And then there was yeah. other ones where I used buckshot. Yeah. That's another thing that could change the dynamic of shotgun as well. I recall one of the stages in that that one. I've only shot one of those matches, and one of the stages was like forty yard paper targets. Yes. And that's a real question of. Are my sights good enough to use slugs? Mm-hmm. Do I take one slug shot at each of these things? Or do I know my choke well enough to use buckshot? Mm-hmm. Is, do I have some you know, hacked off open, open right. choke yep. where you know, I'm going to have a six foot spread at 40 yards and maybe I won't get two hits? Mm-hmm. Yep, 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 exactly. And so, that, so all that together can make, I think you can make a two gun yep. shotgun and pistol match Incredibly compelling and very practical oriented. It just takes a little bit of tweaking. You know what else? We can put in the link, in mm-hmm. the description, a link to video of that match. Oh, yeah. We took video of it. I yep. believe you ran an, an uber high end Vepper 12. Mm-hmm. Well, it was yeah. a, it's my Saiga yeah. with the red dot. And I ran a single shot martini police gun. Yep. <laughs> and it was lots of fun both ways. It was. It was. So, yes, uh, maybe we'll do it again someday. I believe you beat me in that one. I'd have to go back and check. But. Yeah, it yeah. might happen. So. All right. Next one, maybe. Next one, Gas Air Spark. Interesting name. I wonder if that's his Christian name given by his parents. We shall name this child Gas Air Spark. Could be an alias. Uh, he grew up knowing how to diagnose engines. Oh, fair enough. Do you reload, and if so, what kind of equipment do you prefer? No. I did at one point. It's been years and years and years since I did, and it's just a matter of time. You've got a bunch of reloading gear that's still like in a box. Yeah. You just haven't put it up. I just haven't. Since the last time I moved, I haven't set it up so what this could tell you the do. yeah so what this could tell the astute viewer in our audience um or that they may already make this a conclusion when we're shooting weirdo guns chambered in weirdo things either we have acquired that ammo somewhere or i made it yeah. um so in that regard i have a reloading a pretty significant reloading bench configuration mm-hmm. uh my pref my preference for most things that are normal is my Dillon 450. I think they're called 450s. They're the it's the semi progressive or the 500. I don't remember the Dillon. It's a Dillon blue, okay. uh, blue press Dillon, but it's not a full progressive. It's a semi progressive in which you index the turret per. And as a result, you can use it as a single stage or double stage or triple or quadruple. So you can go full on progressive as you just manually move it. But what I'm going at here is as you pull the arm, it doesn't actually um, index automatically. Okay. It's up to you to, if you want to switch stations. And so sometimes I'll have the station set up where I will do things as individual steps, but I will not progressive 
do it in a progressive manner. Okay. And then for the really weird stuff, I have a single stage Forester, or Redding, excuse me. And that one is for like 4570, 45, 120, weird long cartridges that require a lot of torque. And you really don't want to do that on any form of progressive or multi turret press because some of that stuff you really are cranking to resize cartridges. Or even more so, um, if I'm changing a cartridge into another cartridge, you yeah. want that single stage press because you lube the hell out of it. Let's say, for example, you're converting X to Y. Yeah and you're gonna put a shoulder into something that normally didn't have a shoulder, you shove that in there and then I'll have that, I'll even have a cheater bar and just crank on that thing with lube on it and you seat that thing up there and then once it's in, you don't have to get it out without getting right. stuck, which is where the lube comes in. But a single stage is where you want that. Yeah. You don't want a multi tour for that. By the way, he goes a step farther than this and you do your own bullet casting. Too. Oh yeah, I've cast, some I've, actually some of the stuff we've done on the video has been yeah. bullets that I casted. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, some of the stuff I have to cast, it's like it's either so cost prohibitive as to not want to buy them or flat out i can't find these anywhere at some point here we're going to do some video with an evans carbine yes and that required creating was it 42 evans yeah which a lot which, of single stage press work involved in and that. i'm not even in using dies for that i'm using a combination of dies from different cartridges to get it right yeah and it, it, i succeeded yeah. i was able to get it to work so um yes i do reload and a lot of what you see when it's weird on the channel was probably reloaded on my bench yeah including black powder which is another thing yeah we shot some black powder cartridges on the on the mat on the channel and um you every once in a while goax would put out like commercial black powder loaded or you'll see a commercial or you'll see some guy who's trying to commercially reload and the prices are insane on black powder stuff because it's yeah. special lube, special bullets, black powder, wads, all this stuff that goes on with that. And so if it's black powder on the channel, I made that. Yeah. Because it isn't worth paying what they want for those cartridges. And black powder is a whole nother game. Yeah, it is. It really it's is. Different. It's a giant mess. All right. Kyle C. In your opinion, can submachine guns become relevant again if they're rechambered in PDW cartridges? Some of the new flavors, such as 6.5CBJ, can be chambered in 9mm SMGs. So maybe these new rounds can give weapons like the MP5 and Uzi a new lease on life. Your thoughts? No. I think the things that make submachine guns obsolete and less practical mm. aren't really about the cartridge. Or if they are about the cartridge, they're about the difference between a pistol cartridge and an intermediate one. I think we've already seen this done. Uh, the P90 is an example of where they, they made a cartridge specially designed in a submachine gun PDW type sized configuration gun, mm -hmm. but provided it with specific goals in mind, which was armor penetration, armor, yeah. just enough energy to be lethal at 100 yards or less, probably 50 yards or less. And I think that when you look at the P90 or the HK, uh, the MP7, MP7 yeah. those are already, they've already tried to do that. Yeah. And they have a niche application, and I don't think they should be underestimated in those applications. No, they're quite effective guns yes i mean they, they do what they're supposed to but when it comes down to it this goes all the way back to world war ii mp40 or stg44 you're going with the stg because yeah. it's not so much more recoil that you can't handle it but what you can do with it is so much more than a nine millimeter yeah so no i don't i don't think so and i think niche niche stuff like the p90 and the mp7 have a place and i think that we sometimes underestimate that place maybe there's more role for those than our um that you see being applied in the in the current world but at the same time it's still yeah it's a sliver yeah patrick w for both of you what in your opinion is the most mechanically interesting how it functions firearm you've ever seen or heard about and i'm sorry if this has been answered before i don't think actually anyone's asked that and you're going to have a better answer than this i think what's the most mechanically interesting gun you've dealt with ever oh some of the conversions from uh bolt action to semi-auto Rifles, oh, without yeah. really any doubt. Um, some of them are more complex than others. Probably the just most goofy, ludicrous one I've ever done was a, I think it's pronounced Snob, S-N-A-B-B. Mm. Um, it was a, a I think late 1930s. It was mm -hmm. very late. A uh, Swedish company came up with a total Rube Goldberg idea. For Does that mean to, fast? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. It went from bolt action to semi-auto. Right. Allegedly, I have my doubts how well any of them ever worked. Sure. Uh, and they came up with this idea for, like, generic application to bolt actions. So the ones, the surviving examples, fortunately no one was dumb enough to actually buy this thing on a military level. Mm -hmm. But they had a bunch of, of test guns that they, you know, presented at trials. And so you'll find vert, snob versions of, like, everything. There's a... Oh, wow. If you do a, a search on the net, you'll find a 1917 Enfield. You'll find a 1903 Springfield. There's a Mauser 98. Uh, out there. So they snobbed, they snobbed the heck out of things. Yeah. All in right. fact, I have a video where I actually managed to get my hands on one at the Dutch Military Museum. Mm -hmm. A 
Dutch moniker that they turned into a semi-auto this way. And we took it apart, and boy, it took time. Uh, that's one where I was not even able to show the disassembly on camera because mm. we got it apart once, and we're like, not a g- that's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, let's show how it works, and we'll put it back together and then never touch this again. So this is, I'm going to go ahead, I'm, I'll answer the question too in a minute, but mm-hmm. it, um, so this this is an issue in which they there was like these mass stockpiles of these bolt-action guns left over after World War One, for example. Yeah. And there's all these people who are like, well, obviously bolt-actions have seen the end of their, really, they're obsolescent. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do we do to take these stockpiles and turn them into something semi-automatic? And the reality is there was a number of efforts to do that, but the cost and reliability yeah. turned out to be, it was more expensive than just making a new gun. Uh, it could well, it could be in in order to make them actually work it would have been and they're so Rube Goldberg and That's some of the, them are flat out scary yeah. looking yeah yeah with that bolt flying back and like yeah. what was that in, there was an Enfield where like there's literally an armor plate yeah. to stop you from putting your face in front of this like, extremely high velocity bolt yeah there are a couple yeah. Enfield conversions the Charlton the Howell yeah um, the U O T H U O T conversion of the Ross. Um, some of those were actually light machine gun conversions of bolt action rifles mm-hmm. and those actually worked a little bit better because there wasn't a weight restriction. So if you're trying to make oh, a semi-auto shoulder yeah. rifle, Good point. you can't really go above 10 pounds. If you're going to make a light machine gun, it's like, well, you know, 20, 25 pounds is fair game. So the most hmm. effective one that I'm aware of is actually the Charlton. It was an Enfield, bolt-action Enfield. In fact, they use mostly old ones, like Lee Metfords and Long Lees, because those were the really obsolete guns that were easily available. Uh, and they made something like 1,500 of them um, as, a la- as an oh, God, the Japanese are going to invade Australia, and we've got no guns. Uh, and they never ended up getting used. Um, None of this stuff's ever been fielded, really. No, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Um, I shouldn't say that so quickly, but I'm pretty sure, well, no, none of this has ever really been fielded. Yeah, somebody probably shot someone with it somewhere, but, I yeah. mean, it was never something that was ever really, like, yeah. issued. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I mean when I say that. Yeah, yeah they're, 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 those are interesting, i got to say. There's a video, I have a video on the Howl as well. And that one actually has shooting. That's another Enfield conversion of, we take the Enfield and we <laughs> a gas piston on the side of it, and presto, now it's semi-auto. Mm. It yeah. worked. It was it was pretty Rube Goldberg. But Yeah, I wonder how long it would work. So you've had more experience with that. I've never even dealt with those. So when, when I saw this question, the things that popped in my mind are not as exciting as that. You're probably thinking guns that are mechanically interesting because of how efficient and elegant no, and how no. well they work. No, actually I'm not. The two that I'm thinking of are kind of yeah. weird. Um, the two that popped in my mind, oh. I had two. Yeah, I think I know what these are going to be. One is the Schwarzlosa blow forward pistol. Oh, huh, okay. That's a simple gun. Got it. But yeah. the mechanism and how it works where they actually induce more recoil than they should for the cartridge, yeah. the fact that the slide blows forward on a recoil wall is... Um, very interesting. Yeah. Like, that's something that's like, oh, wouldn't even have occurred to me. Yeah. And the fact that it actually, I've used a couple of them now, and they've been reliable. Yeah. They, the the recoil works. sucks, but I'm like, it works, which yeah. I can see. With, so that's one. The other one that popped in my head, and maybe this is where you're going or not, I'm curious what you're thinking, I'm thinking, is the FG42. Oh, okay. So, okay, so it's a derivative of the Lewis. Mm-hmm. you got this open to closed bolt mechanism with different sear engagements, which acts a lot like a submachine gun. But then even more weird was what Louis Thonga did with the chamber to delay the yep. action by actually blowing out the chamber so when the cartridge fired, it would expand and open, which just held it in dwell time just a little bit longer to yeah. put that gun a little closer to safety margins. And so in that regard, the fact that it's this modernized Lewis open bolt, closed bolt, multiple sear engagement thing where when you drop the, when you fire the gun in semi-auto, the entire gas piston actually drops with the whole thing, kerchunk, which is much like a sub gun. And then the actual cartridge is blowing out to increase dwell time. To me, for me, that's the most mechanically interesting thing I've personally dealt with because there's a lot of weirdness going on in that gun at once. See, I thought you were going to say the G41. Yeah, that's not as weird because of the bang system. Yeah. yeah, but that's interesting. I agree. But that's good too, and that's a good com- contender. Yeah. But I think the FG42 has more aggregate strangeness at once. Okay, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. So I would yeah. go with the 42. the The 41 is interesting in that it's the only one that was actually fielded and really issued in production numbers with the bank system, where there's a big old trap on the front yeah. and it catches the gas and then runs it around the barrel to actually run the system. Early M1 Garands were like that, but s- uh, very few of them the were in the field, and they. Yeah. They're not as weird as the No, the 41. 41's weirder. Yeah. But uh, no, I think the 42 is the one that has the most amount of strange stuff simultaneously going on. Okay. That's my thought. Yeah. And I think that's defensible. That's valid. It's defensible. Yeah. All right. Lurker, 45. Since the typical 19th and 20th century bolt-action infantry rifle had a much longer range than actual combat showed to be useful, does this mean the entire genre of long-used rifles were a mistake? No. Um, because they were usable out to those extreme ranges. 
not with an individual guy taking an individual sight picture, but remember that these guns, when we're talking the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, before World War I, mm -hmm. we're still, a lot of militaries are still in this cl uh, close order of battle idea that mm -hmm. you have a unit and it marches as a unit and it shoulders up and it fires as a unit. And with, with the Russo-Turkish Russo War and the Boer War in particular, a bunch of conflicts in the late 1800s, people started to realize that maybe this wasn't going to last. And we had to come up with open order uh, battle plans where you actually gave individual initiative, you know, leadership roles to very small units and let them use terrain to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're talking about troops in, in confined units, which we see as the standard in the U.S. Civil War mm -hmm. and going into World War I, um, the ability to, they, they really could engage enemy troops at 1,000 or 2,000 yards because mm -hmm. your target isn't 100 guys over an acre all hiding behind hill, you know, little bumps in the ground. Your target is a group of, a, a big square of men all marching together. Yeah, you're not aiming column. at the individual soldier, you're right. aiming at this contingent of men marching towards you. And if you look at some of the old uh, training, uh, test reports when they look at accuracy at very long range they're not shooting at bullseyes they're shooting at basically yeah, like true. canvas strips you know they'll have a target that's 30 yards long and the height of a man and that's that's the target because that's what they were literally shooting at um this the franco-prussian war for example there were some some battles where the french were extremely effective with chassepots at a thousand thirteen hundred yards or meters because the rifles were accurate enough to shoot there. They had the velocity mm. to get there. And you'd have 100 guys all firing at once. And it's like long-range artillery. A couple things come to mind on this to me when you're talking. I was listening to that, and I think I, I, it's all true. Um, so when they were testing, for example, the range and capabilities of the 4570 and the trapdoor, mm -hmm. they had ranges that were so extreme that they put out really gigantic targets. Mm -hmm. And the bullet was actually coming down like this. Like yeah. They were arcing so high that the bullet was coming down, not at a 90 degree, but close to a 90 degree angle perpendicular to the earth and they have to have the targets almost flat to even have holes to measure yeah and that was the same concept they were trying to do now what that didn't mean was that aimed fire with that cartridge was realistic what they right. knew was uh, stuff's way over there and shoot at that stuff and we're all going to do this in mass and some of it's going to hit stuff yeah and that was true but the thing is the course of combat and the type of battle changed over time and it took a while for the guns to change under the mindset of what battle was now versus what it was then Right. So, and for a long time, you had a situation of, okay, we know that 90% of our combat is, you know, within 300 meters, mm. but is it really that expensive to, to let the site go out to 1,200? Mm -hmm. And what about, just like you'll still get people today who go, bayonets aren't obsolete because there was that one British unit in Afghanistan that captured some Taliban with a bayonet charge. Mm. Therefore, we shouldn't take bayonets off the rifles. Well, same thing applies. What about that one time when you manage to spot the Germans at 1,200 meters, mm -hmm. and they're all in a group because they're having lunch or something. Well, if you didn't have the sight set, you couldn't do it. But if you're willing to just have that 1,200 meter setting, then okay, you can shoot at those guys the, and the, effectively. The counter to that, though, is that you are still hindered with the overly powerful cartridge for any other combat use than that. Yes. And that's where I think the problem came about. So we saw, I mean... Gosh, you know, you really started seeing this just even after the Civil War, but you didn't see it in military circles. And this is where we talk about with the lever gun things. Mm -hmm. Civilian guys and cowboys, guys, whatever you want to call that, the frontiersmen, mm -hmm. saw the value of lower power, higher, lower power, higher capacity, fast to fire guns. Yeah. They saw the value of that because they were not in a squad. They were not in a military contingent. It was them and two buddies against a raid of hostiles. And if you think about it, that is open order combat it is because they were all immediately going to be using cover moving independently and and yep. being able to exploit rapid fire and, and suppression is a thing and then in world war one you start seeing this really happening at the end with yeah. the storm troop and some of the other shock troops and the mp18 shotguns on the american yep. side where they're absolutely sacrificing range for speed right and close range power and because the trenches got closer and closer together trench warfare is feet not yards and they started seeing that and then even in the 20s you started seeing development of intermediate cartridges even when the courts yeah. started well before world war ii started yeah it didn't get implemented until the mp43 or 42 right but all that stuff was in development in the 30s yes and then in 42 they finally issued the first real assault rifle in the mp42 variant right and then the scg44 came but that the concept was there but it took a long time for the guns 
to manifest in a way that reflected the reality of modern warfare. Yeah. So were they a mistake? No, they were just used longer than they should have been. Just like bayonets still to this day. <laughs> yeah, which we get harped on on this channel quite a bit, actually. So not a mistake, just used for too long. Fair? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Andy Fox. What is the best way to prepare for a gun competition? Minimum gear, budget, best first weapon. Not a Carcano or Enfield, I would guess. <laughs> what no. basic shooting ability do I need to be middle of the pack? I would like to get started in one of these competitive events and avoid coming in dead last. My first statement is, forget the second, that last yeah, sentence. You will be dead last. Just roll with it. Avoid, the, avoid coming in dead last is the least of your priorities for your first competition. Yeah. The first competition isn't even basic shooting skills. The first competition is, how am I safe yeah. on the clock? Yep. So what, what that means is things like what does it mean to have to show clear? What does it mean to what does it mean to uh, maintain the 180 with the muzzle discipline while you're moving from left to right or downrange or uprange so you're not sweeping yourself or others? Yeah. What does it mean to run dynamically on the clock by keeping your finger off the trigger and safety engaged almost automatically? Mm -hmm. These are not shooting skills. These are administrative skills. handling skills. Yeah. That's more important than shooting skills. Right. You could come out there DQ not DQ, time out on every stage, miss every target but still have all of these safety administrative skills under your belt and, and you would still win. you would still be a valued competitor. Yeah. If absolutely. you come out there and you've got great shooting skills but you can't handle the gun safely to save your life or others, you don't want to be there. Right. So actually the emphasis is first that. Yeah, start with safety. Yep. Um, well safety and understanding how matches run. Yeah. So like some matches for example, cowboy action. If you decided I'm going to become a cowboy action shooter, first thing I want to do is go out. They have their own loading system where you go to a mm. loading table and an unloading table and the and the way you load your guns is a they have their own administrative rule set around that. If you go to a two gun action challenge match, we have our administrative rule sets. Some three guns require you to load the shotgun at a table but bring it up empty chamber. There's like all these things. So what you need to do is familiarize yourself with their administrative overhead first so that you're safe. Then the next step is shooting skill makes sense yeah for gear the easiest things you have to shoot with which would be an ar-15 and a glock and a glock yeah yep. and, i mean if if it's some different flavor on that any any black p mag adapter <laughs> and and any modern automatic pistol but i think that the point is we, we see this a lot because of in range yes and there, i'm not i'm not leave the fun guns at home for your first match i'm not dissing this i get it but people come to their very first competition ever and maybe they don't have an AR. Let's say they only have historical guns. Got it. Don't make this stop you from coming. Right. But if you have, let's say you have an Enfield or a Carcano or um, a Trapdoor Springfield at home or whatever your particular historical interest is and a single action army, but you also happen to have an AR-15 and a Glock. Or a Mini-14 or an SKS or anything more modern. Right. Bring the most easy use guns, most modern easy use guns you have for your first, if not multiple first events. Yeah. They're going to, all of these older guns are harder to use, harder to be safe with, for the most part, harder administratively, far harder to be effective with. Yeah. That helps into the not coming dead last, by the way. And all of that stuff, on top of that, when you bring that to a match that may not be as old gun friendly as ours is, you show up to a, let's say a traditional three gun match with your uh, Martini Henry and your, your um, oh, what the hell is the shotgun that the, a Burgess, or like all this weird stuff. These guys are going to be like, they're not Sh show clear like yeah. you now have a problem with your ROs so go feel it out bring the most modern stuff enjoy understanding how the match works learn how to move on the clock learn how to deal with the clock and under stress without the additional overhead of my god I'm on the clock under stress and this gun is a son of a bitch to use <laughs> which is what happens when yeah. you bring that old stuff absolutely yeah, yeah. I, 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 this sounds arrogant, and I don't mean it to, because I think that you represent this as well. On our videos, we honestly make running those old guns look a lot easier than it is, because we shoot them a lot. Yeah. But the reality is, it is a and, struggle for both of us. And because we're extremely comfortable with the match environment. Yeah, the match environment is completely done secondary. It for years, the timer doesn't have an effect. I'm not worried about showing clear. I'm not worried about am I do I have proper trigger finger discipline? Because I've spent enough time at competitions yeah. that that's all basically unconscious at this point yep um, agreed so if you if you try and start with that sort of stuff you're gonna just make things harder bringing old timey guns is expert mode yeah exactly. so and, until you're ready for expert mode i'm not talking about expert mode in terms of finishing i'm talking about about fin where you place i'm talking about not dequeuing on expert mode yeah um those are the old timey guns until yeah. then bring your best yep yep bring the sunday best 
show off your best and learn, and then eventually bring out the cool guns. And the one last thing I'll throw in is bring a holster that appropriately oh. retains your gun. Yes. Now, this is more important in two gun because we do a lot of movement, mm -hmm. less relevant for something like Ipsic, but don't have your gun fall out on the stage. That's just bad. It's the number one DQ. Yeah. For us. So, that, and that's far more important than having good mag pouches. You can stuff a mag in the back pocket of your jeans yeah. and be pretty much fine. It may yeah. not be the fastest, but it'll work. And yep. you don't have to spend money on it. But have a holster that's not a Serpa that reliably re retains the gun while you're moving. And now we're going to hear why a Serpa. The reason why not a Serpa is because Serpas are inherently dangerous, bad designed holsters. Yeah. Got a whole... You can dig in on that. We're now going to have separately. comments all about how theirs never hurt them. But the reality is they're garbage. Sorry. All right. Moving on. Tim K. What would you recommend as a good first pistol that will be a range toy only? That's a hard one for me. I've been oh. eyeing Browning Buckmarks and a GSD 1911 and 22LR. If it's a range toy only, then it's entirely up to your personal preference. That's what um, I was thinking. Now, obviously, it sounds like he's looking for a 22. Yeah, it does. Um, I would not buy a 1911 22. No, I wouldn't I don't, I, I don't think I would ever, short of wanting to have a historical Colt Ace, uh, I'd skip that. They just don't work reliably in my experience. Um, Buckmark's not a bad gun. No. Um, when I shot Bullseye, 22 Bullseye in school, we used Smith & Wesson 41s. Mm -hmm. Those are fantastic guns. If you want something cool and historical, a Walther Olympia isn't that expensive, and it's a really quite nice gun. Uh, Colt Woodsman would be in the same boat. The Walther P22 is actually not bad, too. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking for 22, now we're, we're going 22 here because you mentioned 22 LR. The Walther, the, the, the P22 is a nice little yeah. 22 caliber pistol. Um, 22 in general is not the most reliable in any gun. Like, they're yeah. always a little funky. Um, but if it's just for plinking and for fun, then, I don't know, I, my thought would be actually I would look at the Walther because a lot okay. of people I know have them and they really enjoy them. Yeah. So. All the major brands are going to work fine. I would avoid 1911 conversions. But on that note, if you're going to skip the whole 22 thing and it's a range toy only, what do you like? Yeah. I mean, at that point, it could be a Luger. It doesn't really yeah. matter because you're not there on the clock. You're not there for a timing. You're not on a competition. You're not trying to prove anything. Or besides maybe skill set build your marksmanship, it should be whatever you enjoy as long as it's safe. Yeah. So that could be, a, I mean, for that matter, it could even be a, God forbid, a C96 broom handle. <laughs> now, that's not very fun in my opinion. A Luger would be more fun. But, I mean, it's what what... What turns your crank about yeah. what you like, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, London J, what would a gun need to have to actually beat the AR as a platform? I know you guys have made a very compelling argument and view it as the current best, but what would it take for a new rifle or carbine to beat it? 65 years of development. Well, I mean, the answer to me is it's got to be lighter weight, more accurate, less recoil, and higher capacity with a smaller package. Easier handling. More... more yeah, with More better, better with, with designed e controls. Most better. Uh, even better ergonomics. Good I'm, luck. I'm hard-pressed on how you're going to pull that off. Yeah. I'm not saying the AR is the end of the world, but man. Um, I, no hmm. gun coming out of the gate is going to be better because everything requires yeah. iterative development. Yeah, I agree. But let's say that's happened. What would it take to beat the AR? And I just hmm. said that. Yeah. Lighter weight, more accuracy, less recoil, higher capacity. I mean, those are the things you'd be looking for. Yeah. And the reason the AR is where it is is because it has all those things. Right. And because it's been adopted by the U.S. military, so it got all of the development, which means it's going to be as, as more reliable than anything else you're going to find out there. Yep. Wow. Everything's compromises. But, yeah. <sighs> yeah, I, I, it's like, is the AR the end of the kinetic weapons platform for small arms? Probably not, but... It's like, I don't know, energy weapons? I mean, something completely changing the game entirely? What did they do to improve flintlocks? Nothing. They invented a fundamentally different system. I think improve, they, improve uh, percussion. I kind of think that's where we're at with intermediate-type um, rifles. Yeah. Carbines. Is that there's a couple of them there that now exist. The AK is a little bit obsolescent in terms of weight. But the AR, there's a couple iterations. The SCAR. I mean, these things are all AR-like, really, in their ergonomics and their approach to the topic. Right. And so these are all just takes on the same idea. What's going to have to change is the entire idea. Yeah. Really? Yep. Yeah. Ian. Oh, this, yes. is, this is... No, no, this guy's Ian. Not Ian. Oh. Who's on first? Well, who's in that chair? <laughs> Ian. Who's in the question? Ian. I Ian. must have submitted this question in my sleep. Yeah, Ian, this is for both of us. If you had to pick a second caliber for the What Would Stoner Do rifle, what would it be? If all 5.56 on the planet disappeared, it could not be made again. I've actually answered this before, but you go ahead. 5.45. 5.45. Five. Yep. Because it's... Actually, kind of even more pleasant than 5.56. The 224 Valkyrie is not a bad one. 
Yeah. If you were assume it, the problem with 224 Valkyrie is it's never going to catch on because it's not better enough than 556 to justify any any substantial adoption by any real organization. If we're talking hypotheticals and all the 556 just goes poof and you get to pick a new one from scratch, I can see that. I would see I could see if if for some reason any type of high velocity 22 caliber intermediate cartridge was no go. Obviously, 6.5 has a lot of possibilities in terms of its ballistic yep. coefficient and all the things that it can do. However, uh, it is hard to overstate the value of a low recoil 22 caliber high velocity cartridge, such as 5.45 or 5.56. Five, that is 2.24 Valkyrie. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I guess. That question always kind of makes me go, uh, uh. If you want a little bit more velocity than 5.56, five, if you think the AR ought to be a little more powerful, mm. 2.24 Valkyrie, if you, want a, if you think that the AR ought to have a little bit less recoil, than 545. And I'm on the 545 yeah. side of that. As well as 545 is an incredibly comfortable cartridge to carry a lot of. Yeah, it is and light. That's another thing you cannot overstate, which is how important it is to be able to carry a lot of that stuff without a big weight impact. And the bigger and more powerful the cartridge it gets, even in small amounts, starts adding more and more mass yeah. to how much of it you can carry. So I'd right. rather have more. I wouldn't be upset with either one, though. I'd rather have more, though. Okay. Jack C. To what extent has the development of the AK, was the development of the AK based on that of the STG44? Everything I has uh, read on the internet has either said the AK is a direct copy of the SCG44, which is obviously not true, or that the AK seemed to be developed entirely in a vacuum, which I, again, am suspect of. I'm curious to both of your opinions are on this. I have an entire video discussing this. Well, we can point to that, but yeah. we can talk about it briefly. Uh, I think Kalashnikov saw, took elements from existing guns, uh, took the concept from the Sturmgewehrs, uh, a number of the elements, the mechanical elements of the AK are pretty obviously taken from the M1 Garand, uh, basically the bolt and the trigger mechanism, uh, put them together. The Russian industry failed to manage to effectively manufacture them, as you see in the, the very first, the actual AK-47, mm -hmm. the Type 1s. And they then had captured German engineers uh, who assisted them in setting up, not designing the gun, but the industrial infrastructure to produce it. The ability to improve their to to increase their skill set with stamp stamp exactly. sheet metal and stampings and all that. Yeah. So I, people I, underestimate the the amount of the the difficulty and the amount of expertise required not to design the gun but to actually take a handmade gun and turn it into a mass produced item. Mm -hmm. Even you know even Browning when John Browning designed guns, he would make a he'd come up with the idea he'd he'd patent it mm -hmm. he'd make a patent model and he'd sell the model and the patent rights to a company like Winchester. And Winchester then would go through and, and they had some brilliant engineers whose job was to turn this into something marketable and producible. If you go to the Cody Museum, they have a whole bunch of Browning's original patent models. Mm -hmm. And they do not really quite look like Winchester's production guns. And that's the pro that's that's where the, Ger I think, where the German influence on the AK was, is how do we take this idea and turn it into something you can actually build? I think, I think it's the most rational explanation. So when you look at this, so we talked earlier in this video alone that the AMM records existed as a concept and even already as a cartridge before World War II even started. Yeah, in the 30s. Right, so the Germans were ahead on the intermediate cartridge because then the 762 by 39 is called the M43 for a reason. Mm -hmm. 1943. The Russians were developing some of the stuff before the war as well. Right. Which everyone was Fair at enough. some level. But, but, but I think what happened is this. So the Germans have incredible stamp sheet metal technology and capabilities. That's something the Russians would have liked to have had. They come out with the MKB-42 and then, of course, the MP-44 and the SCG-44, which is by no means is the AK a copy of that. However, it is was conceptually influenced right. by it. Yeah. So they look at that and they're like, okay, this concept makes sense. You could also... The same argument you can make about the SCG-44 being, in, or excuse me, the AK being a derivative of the SCG-44, you could say an AR-15 is a derivative of the MP-44. Yeah. The concept is the same. They implemented a, a fairly significant number of the first quote-unquote assault rifle in the battlefield with an intermediate cartridge. Everyone, not just the Russians, took note and went, huh, that makes sense. Boy, that works well. Some people adopted it sooner than later. The Russians did because they had already had a large um, belief in the submachine gun, as was talked to them by the Finns, and they started using submachine guns heavily in World War II as their predominant weapon. They went, oh, we can make the submachine gun more powerful. They saw what the Germans did, and Kalashnikov, amongst others, designed their version of the concept. Yeah. And then I'm going to go ahead and chime in with what you said. When the war ended, their version of Operation Paperclip, which is let's get a whole bunch of German scientists and engineers under our roof, were helped them not design the gun, but improve the ability to manufacture it. Yep. So it is not 
a derivative of the MP44. It is influenced as a artistic um, and a conceptual idea. Remarkably, the truth lies somewhere in between the two extremes. Yep. Yep. It wasn't oh, shocking how that works. And it doesn't function the same at all. Yeah. So mechanically, it's quite different. Yeah. Yep. Garrett S. Do you think a different caliber would fare better than 5.56 at handling steel ringers at 2 GACM? For example, a 6.8 SPC has more energy, but only a marginal increase in fault recoil, so it might be better for the spinner. Or the flatter shooting 6.5 calibers for less distance shooting since it doesn't drop as quickly. Nope. Well, those things are technically true. I don't think it matters, though. But not practically speaking. Here's why. So when you get to enough of a power, when your power level increases sufficiently that the spinner becomes a negligible issue, 308, 8mm Mauser, yeah. it takes two rounds, three rounds, right. one round even sometimes, to spin it with some of those, like 198 grain a Mauser. Man, I've seen it spin with one round. It has happened. Um, however, the amount of recoil that you're now dealing with and the amount of capacity limitations you have as a result, as well as the shot-to-shot -shot recovery is so impaired that you've lost the benefit everywhere else. Yeah. If you start going to middle ground, like 6.8 SPC or 6.5s or whatever. Or 75 grain, 77 grain, 5.56. Five, well, that is the middle ground, and we already see people doing that. Yeah. So, well, and there, it's not going to... The benefit from the ener the extra energy isn't enough to make up for a lack of shooting skills to actually hit the spinner at the right timing mm -hmm. to make it work. Yep. Once you have the shooting skills, you really can do it. You, you really have to be very quite very good at it to see the difference between 55 grain and 75 grain in 556 five, and so it's not this is like if i if i'm kind of a mediocre shot what if i go buy a two thousand dollar pistol will that make me a better shot well no you'll like it more once you are a better shot probably yeah. but that alone isn't going to solve the problem and it's not what you should focus on i'm repeating myself again but there's a there's it, it is hard to overstate again the, um, uh, the superiority of a low recoil 22 caliber high velocity cartridge. And 77 grain versus 55, the amount of actual energy dispersion into the target is uh, minimal. Also, by the way, 77s do not shoot as flat as 55s. Right. So you're actually having now to deal with a little bit of more ballistic drop at range, which makes it harder to hit stuff at three and four. Um, and on top of that, three and four are typically not reactive steel targets, they're just ringers. Right. And even a 77 has more of an impact on your ability to keep taking shots with less shot or sight displacer, uh, target and shot um, sight picture displacement than 55s mm -hmm. do. So it, it's all no. a trade off. You're not going to win by gear. You it doesn't matter. To, you have to develop the shooting skills. The only time when 70, now 70, I will say this 68, 69 grand 77s do matter if you're at a place where they're putting targets at three and 400 yards in wind conditions. Okay. Because the ballistic coefficient of those bullets make them better to defeat wind, and therefore your hold off for left or right wind or whatever will be less than with a 55. When you're in high wind conditions at a target of 400, you could sometimes be holding three target distances left of a target yeah. to make a hit. With a 77, you'd have less of that. 68's even more so, well, around the same thing. So you have some wind defeating capabilities, but no, not really. Doesn't really matter. Ryan Z, love the content. Thanks. Do you think that a modern bolt action rifle, rugged, reliable, accurate, still brings something to the table? Or do you think that modern semi-automatic weapons are advanced enough that bolt-action rifle benefits are minimal compared to its disadvantages? All depends on what you're trying to do with it. Bolt actions have no place in the military. Well, what about snipers? Uh, Isn't that uh, becoming more dubious uh, and gray now? Yeah, yeah. The U.S. military is using a lot of semi-auto sniper platforms. Semi-automatic guns have gotten to the point where the accuracy differential between that and a, and a bolt-action rifle are so minimally it's different. Pretty darn slim. That it's functionally and practically irrelevant. Yeah. What you can get out of a bolt-action, of course, is it doesn't cycle. But maybe you could turn off the gas system on a semi-auto if you needed it to if you were, like, super deep ops. I mean, no, seriously, you fire the round and that round, poo, I mean, that ejection, that is a potential problem for someone who's stealthy. But, I mean, wow. In, there are applications where you don't need more than one or two shots, like hunting where bolt actions are they do have an advantage because there's just a lot less going on there do they though yeah. see see that, that i would I, even maybe, maybe they don't have an advantage but they don't really have a disadvantage i would even that i would i would question and here's why even hunting like mm -hmm. let's say it's a semi-automatic and you only have five rounds on deck but and you are an excellent marksman and you're a humane ethical marks hunter and you only engage targets at 100 yards or less that well i'm sure you can sure. go further yeah. but you want that clean kill mm -hmm. and that day for whatever reason the cerebral palsy kicks in when you fire that one shot, you boom, and you wound that deer. You know what you can do with a semi-auto? You can yeah. follow up that shot like this. That's true. And even there, I question why you would not just have that. 
Like, okay. if you legally can, why not? Are you, I mean, is it really going to have that much of an accuracy deficiency that you no. suddenly oh, needed no. a bolt gun? No, I just like the simplicity, I think, of having a bolt gun. I'm maybe gonna say, that's just an entirely aesthetic choice. I'm going to say I do not see any advantage at all anymore. And that's the, the properly, maybe cost. That's mm. what it is. You could probably wring more accuracy and practical accuracy out of a lower cost bolt action mass produced gun. You definitely can. Than yeah. you can a mass produced semi auto. However, if cost is not in the equation and you're just looking for functionality, there is no reason to not just go with a semi auto anymore. That's my thought. Works for me. Okay. Brandon T. I am disabled with a weird disease that effectively limits my ability to perform physical activities down to two to four hours tops. Longer if it's cold enough, but I can't wake, wake, work up a sweat and as low as in within 30 minutes or it's too warm and I just cannot keep my body temperature down. Oh, sorry to hear that. That sucks. Yeah. It's like being in Arizona in July. Um, I would really like to get more involved in the shooting sports. So can you think of any alternatives to my increasingly boring go to a cold range while wearing a t-shirt and shorts solution? Well, don't live in Arizona. Um, yeah. I think there are things you could shoot. Frankly, um, there are a lot of things that are not physically oriented that yeah. are great environments like this. Uh, three position um, small bore, um, high power. Yeah, it's Actually, all sorts of marksmanship based, like fundamental marksmanship based competition. That's not doesn't require physical exertion. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. NRA bullseye pistol. Yeah, is another one. Yeah. Um, and boy, and let me tell you, NRA high power, NRA bullseye pistol, three position air gun, uh, twenty two pre uh, uh, precision rifle. This stuff will make you an incredible marksman. NRA high power is your basis of your skill base. Yeah, and you shot a lot of NRA bullseye though, right? Or bullseye uh, pistol? Collegiate bullseye, all 22. Oh, okay, all right. Um, but yeah, for, for what shooting skills I have, they came from a, a fundamental base of bullseye pistol. I would uh, put the emphasis on, on, on some sort of marksmanship type yeah. skill set, and I think uh, bullseye pistol would be a, an exceptionally good choice. Yeah. And it's one that you can typically do even on indoor ranges, or they do them um, in shaded environments. You're not necessarily yeah. in the sun. That would be my recommendation. If you're looking pistol, I would go NRA bullseye pistol. If you're looking at rifle, I would look at, at, at positional or NRA high power. Or if you don't want to go full forward, full fledged high power, look at the, uh, they call them the, um, the M1 Garin matches or the service rifle matches. They're you'd, only at 200. You'd want to avoid something that's base, that has the, the whole bondage. Seat. Right. Well, that's where I was going. Service yeah. rifle or the okay. M1 Garin matches. The, um, those matches are um, military, mil type okay. high power. Those typically don't have the bondage suits. Okay. And that would be another option. All right. Commander 31. I'd like to know how night fighting was done before the advent of night sights, night vision, or even illumination flares. Carefully? It poorly? It actually wasn't, really. Some of it wasn't. There were a lot of times where actual battle stopped at night. Yeah. And, and a night raid would have been an extremely unusual rare circumstance because unless there was some sort of ambient light condition like moonlight, um, you frankly could not be effective. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the French made some adjustments. Everyone made some adjustments in World War I starting to develop night sights, mm -hmm. um, which is probably earlier than some people expect. Yeah. Uh, but some of that is just large sights and wide open rear sights, and some of it is actual radioactive glow-in-the-dark um, sights. Wow, you know, it's funny. I think about this. The first, they threw out the stage, but at the first Red October Kalashnikov match, mm -hmm. we had a night stage. Mm -hmm. And some people had white lights, which they were, were there was some mistake with the rule sets. Yeah. But some people had them and some didn't. And, uh, and those of us that did not have them really oh, quickly right. learned how incredibly difficult, this was a very low light environment, and yeah. then it was night, there was no moon. Those sites were, for all intents and purposes, useless, invisible. Yeah. The site, the, the targets were barely illuminated with flares or like little, um, what do you call them? Glow si sticks. Glow sticks. But um, you could see the target. But being able to see the the front post, inner, you know, in, superimposed in front of the rear notch, was nigh impossible. Yeah, it was really fire for effect. Yeah, boy, that was hard. So without night sights or white light or night vision or illumination flares or some sort of ambient light, um, when it is truly a dark environment, these things are index fire at best. Yeah. Michael B. Do you see any utility in combat arms using a balanced recoil system or mechanical equivalent? Examples would be the AO38, AEK971, or the Chris Vector. Not at this point. Maybe if someone can come up with one that's simple and reliable and effective. Mm. Thus far, I don't think any of those things exist. I wouldn't call the... The Chris is not a balanced recoil system. No, but the AEK971 would be. I have no hands-on experience with those. I've never even managed to like put my hands on one to look at it. 
so I can't really comment, but the fact that nobody's actually using them in a large scale tells me that they're probably not ready. Yet. Here's the problem with all of them. They're all Rube Goldberg. Yeah. And so when I see this, you know what I think actually has more merit, although we have not seen a lot of adaptation of it, is the um, um, constant recoil concept hmm. from like Stoner, or not Stoner, Sullivan. Yeah. You see in the Ultimax, um, you see it in the new Knight's Armament light assault machine gun. Yep. Oh, and we saw in in Sullivan's new or his modernized AR-15 that we have a video of on the channel. That changes things a lot. Well, it changes things for fully automatic fire. Well, I think that's what the we're theory. looking at for balanced recoil. I guess balanced recoil in a semi-automatic isn't as mad. It doesn't well, matter as much. In a, in a semi-automatic, it's it's that reducing disruption of your sight picture. But you can do that with with the cartridge choice, with muzzle brakes, with venting. With other with gassing the gun just right, right, things that are a lot easier to do reliably than balanced recoil systems. Like you put a K and S adjustable gas, adjustable gas piston in an AK, which is usually overgassed, and get it just right. That helps. A lot. Oh my gosh, this gun yeah. doesn't move right, and so that's weight, cartridge, recoil, all that stuff. But you can get close to what you get out of a balanced recoil system in a semi-automatic without that weird mechanism. Yeah. And if you want it in full auto, I think you're better off looking at something like constant recoil. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Matthew J. Are there any compelling reasons for having primary rifle, example, competition hunting defense that isn't an AR other than politics? This is kind of like when we had earlier. Is there any compelling reason for having a primary rifle that isn't an AR other than politics? Okay, so throw politics away. Is there a reason that you'd want something that isn't an AR anymore? It depends what you're doing. It always comes down to what are you doing. If I want to go moose hunting, yeah, yeah there's a very compelling reason not to use an AR. AR doesn't apply. Um, an AR, AR in its traditional chambering is only effective to the smallest game. If I want to do action style of shooting competition, absolutely an AR is the best way to go. Yeah. Um, if I want to shoot recreationally, AR is a pretty good option um, because they are cheap, they're available, and the ammo is super cheap and available. Yeah, I, I guess we would need more fleshing out of what this question means when it says primary rifle. It, when, I, when that question is presented without any further details mm. my go-to answer is pretty much going to be AR and Glock it is I'm most likely to get it right with AR and Glock if if I don't know anything more about the person asking the question it reminds me of what's this weird bolt action rifle I found in my closet it's an Arasaka right so if there's a question of what should I get for a primary rifle is there a reason to get a primary rifle that isn't an AR without any other qualifications the answer is no get an AR if there are other compelling reasons for example I'm hunting big game I am shooting at extreme ranges. I'm shooting cowboy action. Well, then you don't need an AR, <laughs> right? That's a completely wrong one. But if you're looking at, is this a is this a fun, recreational, going to use it for most things I'd ever use it for, hunt small game, use it for home defense, air quotes, if such a thing needed to happen with an AR, which has happened, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, then no, an AR is the right answer. Yeah. Absolutely the right answer. So um, I guess without any more clarification... I would say no. There is no compelling reason to have a primary rifle that isn't an AR. Yeah. Leslie W., will there be a Desert Brutality 2019? Uh, that's a question for you. It's a still, it's still, we're still right on the heels of this. Um, Desert Brutality was the beginning of February. Mm -hmm. We're now in March. I am still working <laughs> on a couple things left of logistics from Desert Brutality. Believe it or not, um, the amount of work that goes into, and you, you know this because you mm -hmm. help too, but I mean the amount of work that went into this, it's starting to finally taper down but i mean a month after the event i'm still working on stuff so my compelling an my, my answer is yes um with a caveat i could change my mind yeah i'm pretty sure you'll have you won't have forgotten but the amount of how much it sucked to do will have faded within about six months and you'll and you'll be like Ah, it's a I weird, bittersweet thing again. because the suck to do is weird because the suck to sh the suck part of en the enjoy the being there, the camaraderie, the people coming, the people who did come, the match itself, the stages, shooting the match was glorious. It couldn't, it was fantastic. Yeah. It was a fantastic time. It has sur surpassed all expectations. The awfulness of getting it ready to go, the monetary considerations, the insurance considerations, the designing of the stages, the let's be honest, the politics of organizing these people and that people and the range and this guy and getting everyone at least the logistics. not angry with how things were going. I'm not talking about the match. I'm talking about just the logistical part it was so difficult that it was truly painful. That said, a lot of those logistics and that painful part has been done. Bridges have been built. You've, you've climbed a significant way up the learning curve. We have a range that we've now worked with a second time successfully. 
we have better working relationships with the people that helped us pull this off. Mm -hmm. We have a relationship with an insurance company that next time would be a lot easier to deal with. We know some of the little tiny mistakes that occurred that we can fix. So it should make 2019 desert brutality easier. So my answer right this minute is yes, there will be one. But I'm not ready to, cons I'm not ready to consider scheduling it yet. Oh, God, no. It's only March. <laughs> yeah. This will be a couple months away before we start doing that. Yeah. And we have more desert brutality questions, so we'll go next. Okay. Sean S. And I started touching on this, but we'll get further with this. Now that desert brutality is over and done, what is the one thing that you were most happy about? And what is the one thing that just didn't work out at all? Why don't you start with that? Uh, my FAMAS and the bipod on my FAMAS. <laughs> so it's completely about you. All right, so everything was all right. So it, it's all about Ian on this one. So the thing that, that worked out the best was your FAMAS. I, well, there was a big question for me of, all right, I'm going to take this rifle that is 35 years old yeah. and has not, has basically zero support in the United States. And I'm going to try running it for two straight days in dirty competition environment. How's it going to work? And uh, by the way, this is my chance to, to be able to go through these really cool stages. I don't want the gun to fail. And that, you know, if the gun fails on stage two, well, stages three through eight are like just a missed opportunity. I could have picked something else that would have worked. You had no malfunctions with the FAMAS, correct? This is literally zero. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I am absolutely thrilled that it went through the whole match flawlessly. Mm -hmm. I had not anticipated the a few of the issues with the bipod, which cost me. I I'm pretty. Which I'm going to go out on a limb and say cost me first place in class. I think it could. Um, yeah, you'll see that as the when the desert brutality stage videos go up. But um, there are plenty of other ways to well, take this question. I just let me let me be, let's be fair with experience. your statement about the bipod. Mm -hmm. I would say people will oh, see it's this. my application of the bipod. Well, no, 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 no. I'm going to say this. So I'd say. The videos are not out for Desert Brutality yet because we're still working through SHOT Show content. But they're coming actually mm -hmm. quite soon. Um, and we're going to have a lot of Desert Brutality content. Um, the bipod absolutely helped you. We both yeah. shot in Classic. Virtually. Everywhere. I shot a Galil and you shot a FAMAS. Um, the bipod actually helped you kick my butt multiple times. Yeah. And then eventually, and this was not by design, it just happened to be how the stage worked out. The bipod was a liability on one of the stages in a significant way. As was some of the sight offset height of your of your rifle, uh, yeah, which wasn't intended. It just happened to catch you, mm -hmm. and it caught you pretty hard. Yeah. So, um, but the FAMAS proved itself to be very reliable, incredibly mm -hmm. reliable. It's a very simple gun. This is why this is the thing that was best for me, and also at the same time the thing that was worst. It's a very simple gun in terms of just being delayed blowback. It's I, I, great that it got me to here, and it's bittersweet that it didn't get me to there. <laughs> now. You know, I will say, okay, so this actually helps me answer the question, I think. Um, what's one thing I'm most happy about? I think what I'm most happy about is the stage. Does, so we, we did not pre-shoot stages. We did no. not pre-run the stages. When Ian and I shot the stages, we shot them for the first time ever, just like everyone else. Yep. So those stage designs were completely theoretical on whether or not they were <laughs> going to achieve the goals that the yeah. stage was designed for. When I design stages, I design them, I try to design them with a theoretical goal in mind. Mm -hmm. This stage's purpose is this. This stage's purpose is that. And so that's, I go, I, I like to think at least that I design stages a little differently than a lot of other people because that's how I design stages. Mm -hmm. I also design them with the concept in mind of that this should be achievable, not winnable, with a the least practical but still modern gun of an ACAM. Yeah. Which is why your FAMAS, honestly, was capable to be used in the match. Mm -hmm. the, the, the FAMAS is not obsolete, but it's obsolescent. It's got things that could modernize it. It's, it's an iron-sided rifle so that yeah. makes it ob obsolescent, yeah, obsolescent not obsolete yeah and it, the galil is obsolescent too by, yeah. which i used more so than the famas but we put a classic division in there because i think part and parcel of two of what we do within range is to make sure that we have a tip of the hat to that historicity yeah and having those guns out there have a point mm -hmm. but trying to jam them in with modern guns with modern sighting systems you know, it's a tricky. clutch and it's not fun it's nice to have them have their place and for people to enjoy them in a way that makes sense. And this is where I'm going with this long-winded answer is the thing that worked out best was the stage designs, which were not tested, were in theory only, flowed incredibly well. Yeah. And I think, I would like to hear what you think, I think mm -hmm. they achieved the goals of what they were meaning to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. They were challenging but, uh, but achievable with obsolete military rifles, mm -hmm. semi-autos. This is not a bolt-action match. Yeah. Um, however, they were still also they they weren't a complete cakewalk for open level gear. That's the real balance that we're yeah. getting at here. So it was possible to enjoy the match with a classic rifle, but it was not a gimme 
to the people who came with modern guns. Right. That is an incredibly fine line to walk yeah. when doing stage design. And it's very hard in a very a large sta- match environment in which people are bringing their best gear and their most modern stuff to still give them a challenge. And right. where we balance that line, I, I whatever. That's we, a delicate balance, yeah. Well, but where, where the balance comes, and one of the things that the emphasis on in Two Gun Action Challenge and now Desert Brutality is an attempt to blend a reasonable but not minimal amount of physical out, physicality mm-hmm. and a reasonable but not impossible amount of shooting challenges into one bag. Right. You can make shooting challenges that are impossibly hard and have no physicality, or you can have physicality that, frankly, only three people can finish and have the shooting challenges be... And, <laughs> but but you're, now, you're now putting an emphasis in weird places. We had some stages that were more, a little more physically oriented, and we mm-hmm. had a couple stages that were absolutely more shooting oriented. There was some more tweaking that can be done to that balance, but... It went off for a first, extremely well. For a first attempt? Yeah. I think it was miraculous, to be honest. <laughs> and the other thing was the stages ran smoothly. We had no real significant, oh, man, stage four takes all day. There yeah. was none of that. There was a little waiting around. Tiger Valley, we shot stage one, and we waited, what, three or four eight hours, hours yeah. before stage two. The longest wait we had at Desert Brutality was, what, 45 minutes? Something like that, yeah. That's incredible. It yeah. ran so smooth. And the ROs we hired did a great job. That all went well. What's the one thing that just didn't work out at all? Well, we screwed up. I screwed up the scoring on one on one division, <laughs> uh-huh. um, the the sport division. Um, we were doing all paper scoring, mm-hmm. and boy, practice score, which is all pads, would have been far nicer. Yeah. But we didn't have it because that range facility has no wireless. There was questions about being able to use them in offline mode. La, 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 la. Something to address for next year. But I fell back to my lowest common denominator programming, which is paper, paper. Yeah. and we in the we were actually doing scores in low light we're like couldn't <laughs> see anymore and i made one mistake there was two there were two divisions that were called, one was called sport one was called scout in the future they are going to be named far <laughs> more clearly different because what happened is we had to get all the scores done and then we had to sort them armored armored plus p classic open or whatever sport and scout right we had to have them yep. scattered out and we got all of them right except for a couple sports landed up in the scout pile. And sport was basically open. Open, Which right. means the guys who accidentally got that transposition were like, became the top three people in scout. Scout was the equivalent of tax scope, and sport was the equivalent of open anything goes with no armor and all the garbage. So by the sport getting jammed into the scout, a couple of them, not all of them, just yeah. a few of them, but it turns out the three, literally, the three sport division scores that got accidentally jammed into the scout division were the top three yeah i'm like (laughs) if they had been four five six it would have not been relevant because the only ones that we announced that night were the top three so as a result we have these tabs that say sport first of second and third right Mm -hmm. and we handed them out to the wrong people yeah that did not happen in any other division so that was the only one i am working on fixing that i swear but (laughs) um that was the biggest mistake. And it really, in the grand team of things, was minor. If that's the biggest mistake, it all went But it was, it was really hard for me because I, yeah. I, I pride myself on doing this stuff right. And when I was doing the scores to put them online and I found this, I went, shit. Yeah. Wow. Really? And I felt bad. And I felt bad not because we made a mistake. Mistakes happen. It's human. In fact, the amount of mistakes of this match were so small that it was an incredible success. But I really, the, what I felt bad about was realizing that the announcements were wrong. And I know that that can be... Yeah, it can be a mood killer. It's not ego-crushing, but when you find out later that that turns out was wrong, it kind of sucks. Both for the guys who didn't get recognized when they should have, yeah. and the guys who are like, I got first, and then discover, I didn't get shit. Because it's a lot of fun when yeah. you're first or second or third, and you know what? You walk up and everybody's cheering for you, and you take your tab. Yeah. We got that right on all the divisions but one. We'll get the tabs to the guys, but that was the... Really, in the grand scheme of things, that was the one thing that didn't work out at all, and... To, with deference to the guys who did not get their pad, their tabs when they should have, I still think that was minor. Yeah, it was. Last one. John B. And this is actually a really good one. Hmm. Were there many international Patreon fans at Desert Brutality 2018? I would love to attend next time, but would need to borrow gear. Is this possible? Let's answer those questions separately. Were there many international no. fans? But there were. But there were a few. We had a guy. There from, are never going to be many. Sw- I mean, Switzerland? I think the farthest we had, other than, well, obviously the Varsh Lake guys were yeah, there. Bunch of fans. Um, but as far as, like, an individual coming on their own, the farthest was a guy from Switzerland who, like, I'm going to have a vacation. 
Yeah. I'm going to go here and do the match and then fly home. Do you know how he got his guns here? What did he borrow? Gun? I believe he know? borrowed guns from someone here. Okay, um, so I know he had talked about bringing his Sturmgewehr 57. Oh, that would have been neat. It would have been neat, but I'm pr I haven't looked into the law in detail, but I'm pretty sure because it's a machine gun, even if it's a semi-auto conversion in Switzerland, oh, yeah, it's yeah, still yeah. legally a machine yeah. gun here. No. I don't... I, even, that would be extremely difficult. Even if what you have would be... Oh God, look, oh, even if you're going to bring a K31, yeah. I wouldn't. I don't know... We, we got that question a lot, and I don't have the answer for that because I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV, and I don't want to play one. So when I got questions from international fans, which, by the way, we love you guys as much as we love our domestic fans, mm -hmm. and we'd love to have you at Desert Brutality, when you ask me, can I bring my this or that, and how do I bring it, my answer is, I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know, and I started briefly looking into it, and it went, and my brain turned <laughs> to mush and drained out my ear. I, I don't know. But yeah. what I do know is this. If you're a Patreon fan, there's a good chance you're, well, you are on the Patreon page. If you're at a certain level, you're on our Discord server. Here's the deal. Go on there and go, I want to shoot the match. Can anyone here, would anyone here be willing to let me use their AR-15 and Glock? Yeah. And I guarantee you, you're going to have more than one offer. Yeah. I'm sure of it. Now, renting a gun from someone, renting from like a company is weird and challenging because now they have to have... There might be some constructive possession thing where they have to stay with you or be on your squad or whatever. But if you're borrowing a gun from a friend to shoot the match, work with us when we do Desert Brutality 2019. We'll make sure we get you on the right squad right. with the people you're borrowing gear from. And it is absolutely possible as long as you're able to find someone here that's willing to loan you gear. Yeah. And you can bring all your other gear. Mag yeah. couches, boots, pants, all that stuff. Load bearing, all that. None of that matters. Only thing that matters is the guns. Go on the Discord. Go on the Patreon page. I need to borrow this. And I, it's yeah, gonna, you'll get it. It will happen. Yeah. And it'll probably and be whatever you want. That's what this uh, kid from Switzerland had. He so borrowed the, guns from someone here. So the answer is yes. And if you yeah. plan on coming to the United States and you want to visit Arizona and see things like the Grand Canyon and some Old West stuff, and also come shoot Desert Brutality 2019 when we announce the dates, I don't think that's a problem. No, yeah. not at all. That's it for March 2018 Q&A. All right. Well, and it's um, an hour and 20 minutes. These are always well over an hour. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to get your question in uh, for next month's Q&A, join the Patreon page. It's, I believe, five bucks a month is the level to submit questions yep. for these. We can't get to everyone every month, but we try to get to as many as we possibly can. I was going to say that, even at the, even with it being the $5 level, because we have to have perks. Um, it's like we still get so many questions. This month yeah. alone, for this month, we received 150 questions. Jeez. And this, we did 26 of them, I think, right now. As you can see, that would be literally all of the content in range. If we, we would do only Q&A. And so it's not possible. So we go through. I pick them. Yeah. So if you have answer, asked a question a couple times and we didn't get to it, there's a good chance there's a probably a reason. And there's a video coming about that. Um, it is what it is. But please, uh, we love our Patreon supporters. So really, it's the reason in range exists. Yep. Oh. So. Um, obviously, you can find us wherever you are currently watching us, uh, as well as Facebook, YouTube, uh, Full30, and BitChute. Yep. Oh. So... I think that's all we got. Stay Thanks. tuned for next video. Thanks a lot, guys.